I just think it has always been in me naturally. Wow. And it really, really uh, ascended uh, when I uh, went through incarceration because everything that happened to me with respect to being incarcerated and in those close conditions and even going in the hole and being in a humane situation when I was in the hole for 40 nights, um, animals go through, but animals go through worse. The only thing different between me and that situation of being in a hole and an animal, they don't come out alive. Uh, so that's why I'm really passionate about some of the same things they go through. All right, so here we are, another episode of the Carb Strong Cast. I'm really excited for this one here. We have uh, Dominic Thompson, who's a vegan athlete, an entrepreneur, and an activist. How are you going, Dom? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on this uh, platform. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming in such short notice. Um, been following you on Instagram for a while. I've had a little bit of a look. As you know, sometimes you get sort of caught up in your own platform, but I had a look at yours, and I noticed that you have a very similar background to me in many ways. And... I'm really, really interested for you to tell your story from the beginning. So for those who don't know you, maybe you could give a brief overview of what you do now and then start from the beginning. Sure. Uh, what I do now is <clears throat> I speak out uh, and use my platform to talk about human uh, rights as well as animal rights, uh, social uh, justice. Uh, talk about the... In the U.S., we have a very... Pro, a big problem with respect to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. uh, so I talk about a lot of that stuff. And of course, uh, I started my activism off um, from the days that I used to be uh, incarcerated because I seen the way going through that different type of system, yeah. you know, being put placed in a box. Um, I did about uh, three years of time in federal prison. Mm -hmm. And being put, placed in that situation in some inhumane conditions yep. kind of triggered me to uh, go down this pathway. Uh, so I use my platform to talk about a lot of those different um, things as well as to um, create different lines of services that will have an impact on change. I'm what they call now like a social entrepreneur where you okay. create products and lines of service that have an impact on the system and impact on society. Wow. And that's why I formed Crazies and Weirdos, which is one of the original uh, older clothing uh, vegan companies out there. Uh, we have a lot of successful lines of services. Also created a food and nutrition company called Eat What Elephants Eat, where we teach people how to eat plant-based. Okay. Uh, we're launching a restaurant next year um, in the States, which is going to be starting off in the Atlanta area. Then we're going to do a counterclockwise uh, head around the States. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I want to talk about the early years for you before all of this transformation happened because I'm really fascinated on how someone ends up in prison like where does it begin like wh what neighborhood were you were from what influences did you have or didn't have like how does that all start yeah I'm from Chicago originally I don't know if any people are familiar with that area we they call it the kids call it now Chirac <laughs> yeah uh, because it's one of the cities for years has been uh, known as the murder capital of the U.S. Uh, it, goes up, it goes back and forth with a couple other cities. So I'm from the west side of Chicago. I'm a former gang member. I used to be a part of a gang called the Four Corner Hustlers. Uh, I also, in that gang, I sold drugs. Um, and without going into details of that type of lifestyle, but that specific path um, placed me in different scenarios where I end up eventually getting indicted. Um, and when I say I sold drugs, it wasn't nickel and dimes or nothing like that. It was at a large weight, a large yeah. quantity that had the U.S. government knocking on my door eventually. Um, that kind of started, you know, when I was a kid. Uh, grew up in a single-parent home, no father around, a cliche. Uh, and I'm not making excuses. I'm not playing victim or nothing like that, but I'm just giving you the facts that it was me, my mother, and my two sisters living in a one-bedroom apartment mm -hmm. full of roaches and mice. And it was um, a very uncomfortable situation. Um, and only thing that we had around us in that neighborhood at that time, that specific timeline that I'm describing is uh, gangsters, drug dealers, all types of different personality types that was out there. And... Even it ran deep in my bloodline. I mm -hmm. come from a, a family full of uh, high-ranking uh, street individuals. 
sadly, they all are uh, either dead or uh, doing permanent time in, in the system right now. Mm -hmm. But that had an influence on me growing up uh, where, you know, sometimes you have to do what you have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. And in those scenarios, you have to either go through it, go around it, or you're going to get destroyed by it. And I chose to um, go through it, you know, not around it, not to run from it. Uh, and it placed me in that scenario where I did all I could to get out of it, and I was getting out of it, and it just so happened to caught up with me, yep. you know, with that with that specific lifestyle. Yeah. Um, you say but being brought up in a, uh, a a home with a single parent is kind of cliche, but so did I, and it was something about not having that father fatherly influence that uh, I started to look for that influence in other men who I looked up to, who I felt were powerful, and did you have like those types of influences around yeah. you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and I, I say it's cliche because in my culture, coming from, I'm a man of color living mm -hmm. in, in Chicago. Me, my peers, my friends, yeah. it's it's norm. It's, it's considered norm. the norm. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't walk around like where's my dad. It's like everybody doesn't have a dad. Yeah. In, in that scenario, mm -hmm. where I'm from, uh, it's not till you get older where you can look back and like that wasn't normal. Nah. <laughs> not nah. having a father around to. I uh, tell you right and wrong. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I had cousins, uh, and 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 other people in that neighborhood I, I lived on. One of my most inf one of the guys that influenced me the most was my cousin Booby. He mm -hmm. was uh, a big time dope dealer. Yep. Um, from head to toe, was getting money, fast money, had multiple cars, ran multiple blocks and and areas and stuff like that. He was supposed to call a chief of a gang. He was part of the uh, the vice lords. And, you know, he used to scoop me up, you know, I'd ride around in his Regal, bumping NWA, mm -hmm. rocking and stuff like that. And he was a big influence on me. Like, he kept things away from me, but in a sense also educated me on a lot of other things yeah. in, in that sense. So, yeah, I kind of gravitated towards that. Yeah, so you learned quick that there's a good way to get money and, and power and respect. Yeah, well, it's not just that. It's, again... My era is different than the era now. Mm. Like, I grew up in the 80s. Okay. And, and gangs back then, I think people always place gangs as, they, people like to demonize gangs. Mm. Um, and gangs was originally, if you know your history on gangs, especially in the U.S. I don't know how it is over here. Uh, but in the U.S., gangs was, especially black gangs, was formed uh, to protect the community. Wow. You know, it was formed like the Black Panthers were. Okay. to empower um, black men and women. And so there's a lot of gang members that are uh, women, too. Uh, so it was created to empower the community, to protect the community from um, a lot of systematic stuff that was happening, a lot of redlining and more, and just educate people about black-owned businesses and, mm -hmm. and more. Um, and then this was when drugs, specifically crack cocaine, got introduced into our communities and things started shifting a little bit differently so when you started introducing that fast money. Um, and, I, you know, I don't want to get into, like, conspiracies and stuff like that, but yep. a lot of people do understand that this is not a conspiracy on how the U.S. government actually had a big role in that. We're yeah. trying to destroy the black communities. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's why gangs was originally formed, and you have your principles, you have your laws, you have you have your meetings, yep. just like a fraternity and stuff like that. It wasn't set up to let's go terrorize the neighborhood, let's go go destroy and kill people. It was set up to protect and to empower. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't that wasn't what's really drawn a lot of us from the original gangs and stuff like that. It was just part of our culture and life and just being part of a membership. Yep. Uh, a manhood and a sisterhood yeah yeah so you you obviously felt protected and guided and you were you were a part of something there and so obviously you know you start off lower level dealing and then it just grows and grows and you get more money and you start what happens there i wouldn't call it really level low, low level dealing no. um i'm the type that if i'm gonna jump out off off the uh, out the window i'm gonna go to the roof wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just being real okay. like so it wasn't I, I would say maybe at the most mid yep. tier, you know okay. what I mean? It was never like low, low. I mean, yep. it, uh, in that sense, it's just that it, the gangs was going through a transition around the time I was yep. coming of age okay. uh, and getting involved in that where uh, it was a little bit more flexibility to okay. do be your own entrepreneur in a sense of, okay, if you had a plug and that plug trusts you, 
you know, and you can make it happen and you have a, 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 a clientele yep. or some communities or even low level dealers you can serve and you do yep. what you do, you know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you never got involved with taking the drugs yourself? No, not at all. It's, again, that's, that, that's a, a culture disconnect. Meaning yeah. like we, it's actually considered a violation of the gang yeah. to take drugs and stuff like that. We wasn't brought up taking drugs. We was brought to sell it. I mean, we was educated to sell it. Could we see what it done, done to what we call back in those days, dope fiends and mm. people that was just strung out on it. Uh, but no, never took any drugs. The only drug that I ever took or experimented with was marijuana. Uh, and that's it. And I had my first drink when I was like 13. Uh, mm. But yeah, I never got into like drugs as a someone that used drugs and well, stuff like that. That's... I'm not engineered like that too. Oh. Some people are curious and people like to explore. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm not an engineer. I'm not one of those personality types that like to explore things in that wow. sense. I'm, I'm fine with the sense of reality that I'm in right now. That shows a strong sense of character because uh, a lot of people use the drugs in that world to escape from the reality of it, uh, to deal with certain problems, um, to, to mask certain emotions, and then they fall into it. A lot of people are more predisposed to drug use, but it's good. It's one good thing that the gang sort of tried to outlaw it and considered it a violation. But obviously with um, being on the streets, there's a culture surrounding street justice and violence. Um, did, could you tell us anything about how you, that affected you or did you have like a different view on morality back then as you do now? Same, it, the funny thing about it, I have always had compassion in me. Like yeah. I was never one of those hot heads, like you bump into me, I want to destroy you or no. this person didn't pay what's called a rent on the corner. Yeah. Yep. In, in our system, growing up in that day and age, you had corners that you had to pay rent towards yeah. the hierarchy or the leadership of yeah. those different gangs. And that's when even some gangs even co um, uh, integrated with each other. If one was what's called a drought, had a drought, well, let us continue to supply your clientele and your, your, your community, but we'll pay rent, give you a percentage and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but as far as the violent part of all of that stuff, it was never – Again, I think that's more of a personality type because okay. I I know I I'm not innocent in a sense like I haven't rough you know rough, been 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 around a corner and, and had to get involved in things but I know my ability to hurt somebody yeah. you know what I mean I'm like I'm naturally a strong dude I can physically hurt somebody and also know what man made weapons can do to people so I always has I always had that sense and 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 since I seen my first murder at the age of five. Uh, that had had an impact on me because I've seen so many murders after that. i uh, seen a man getting his head shot off at the age of five. Uh, so I've been around violence since a very young age. Um, and I just felt like that's not the best solution. You know what I mean? That's just me personally I always felt like it wasn't the best solution. Anything I can do to uh, resolve something without physically getting involved, then I would do that. That's uh, quite a phenomenon because what what i see more often is that people become conditioned to violence that makes them you know more in that survival mode and using violence as a first option but for you it seemed like it steered you away yeah i, I again I, I just think it's the personality type some people that like to use violent it's just it might be a, a mental disconnect yeah. you know in some sense but also it might be the way they've been conditioned and, and, and raised mm. um i i i i Phil personally, the one positive role model in my life uh, had an impact for yep. me not to be that, and that's my mother. Wow. You know, my mother's from the civil rights era. She was no-nonsense type of black woman mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Uh, but And she always she told me I always stand up for myself, don't get me wrong. But, again, there's people that want to fly off the hinges and mm -hmm. be aggressive, and my approach is more assertive in, in respect, yeah. trying to get my point across in that sense. So, because again, I, I know my capability. Yeah. And at the end result, no one's going to, you don't want to be uh, either hurting somebody in that sense and getting rid of them permanently, or you don't want to uh, have to go to jail for um, something as um, petty as fighting with somebody. What role do you think fear plays in people being violent? Because it seems like you're very sure of yourself. You're a solid guy. You can handle yourself. You seem confident. Yeah. Uh, if someone is less confident and fearful and they're trying to survive, do you think that would make them more violent? If they're fearful and trying to survive, uh, 
I don't know, because some people, I grew up with people that were fearful, and they'll run away from the situation, okay. or they'll try to avoid the situation. You know, it, mm-hmm. it, again, I think it really varies on it varies. Uh, every personality type, because there's different people, and, and you have a lot of bullying happening and stuff like that, yeah. and, and and there was times, so even in, in the community that I lived in, me being of fair skin, um, people will always try to try to challenge the people that are more fair skin and and in my culture, in my community, from that timeline. So I had to prove my point a lot. I had to fight a lot where they thought, uh, that's just a pretty boy, and nothing was sweet about that. you know. So I had, to, I had to do a lot of fighting growing up in that sense, but that's more defending myself. But being the aggressor, it just never was in me to be an aggressor in that sense. Wow. Yeah. And like, just curious, because um, back in the day when I was involved with a similar sort of lifestyle, Someone showed me animal cruelty once and they were laughing about it and I nearly punched on with them over it. Yeah. And would you have been the same if you said I was the same. Wow. Uh, growing up we uh I had homies that would throw rocks at mm-hmm. stray cats or mm-hmm. do all types of ignorant things to stray animals, squirrels yep. and, and, and whatnot. I, and anytime I was involved in that situation, even the dog fighting, there's a lot of dog fighting uh, mm-hmm. that was happening between the pit bulls. Um, in, in my city and in my neighborhood. And anytime I came across that, even at a young age of being 11, I think the most youngest memory I can remember was 10 or 11, where I would break up those dog fights or slap my, my homies across the back of their head without them knowing, like, what you doing? Like, yeah. don't, you shouldn't be harming animals. Like, that, I just felt like they're vulnerable. Yep. Um, and I felt like that about other human beings. Like, if you are in a position where you're smaller, and if you're not smaller, yeah, some people that are, I grew up with big, big, some homies that was huge, but yeah. they just wasn't there all the way mentally. And, and people would try to take advantage of them like that. I just, one thing I can't tolerate that I can't stand is a bully. Yeah. Or somebody that tries to take advantage of mm-hmm. any human animal or non human animal. And that just ain't cool for me. And that's when I'm going to step in. And I've always stepped in, even as a little boy. Do you think your mom instilled those principles in you young? No, because my if I'm being real, my mom was never a big animal lover. She okay. she cared about humans first, human yep. rights first. Because I mean, think about it. She's from that timeline, yeah. civil rights, and, and went through her and my grandmother and others. You know, that's a very close generation, not too far. Slavery is really not that old, if you think no. about it. Civil rights is not really that old. Uh, so for them to be in growing up in that timeline, especially my grandmother, where they was treated as animals, the last thing on their mind was animals because yeah. they was conditioned to believe that animals are food and they're here for us in that sense. Um, uh, so she, not that part of her with respect to the animal connection wasn't there. I just think it has always been in me naturally. Wow. And it really, really uh, ascended uh, when I uh, went through incarceration because everything that happened to me with respect to being incarcerated and in those close conditions and even going in the hole and being in a humane situation when I was in the hole for 40 nights. Um, animals go through, but animals go through worse. The only thing different between me and that situation of being in a hole and an animal, they don't come out alive. And no. they're also and they're in worse conditions. But just to be in that box condition where you don't know what meal's getting ready to come through that, that door slot or – and you don't have any sunlight or any air circulating and all of that. Yep. And you just, everything reeks of urine and stuff like that. Yep. I've been in that situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why I'm really passionate about some of the same things they go through. Wow. That is a very important connection that not many people's life has given them the opportunity to make. Not many people have lost all of their freedoms that we have in yeah. Western countries. So let's talk about prison. Um, you, you, the feds got you for drug dealing. They might have been doing an investigation or something. They pinned you. Yeah, I uh, got set up. <clears throat> they they uh, was doing an investigation and uh, without again going into details yeah. of the case, they ended up uh, catching up. My old lifestyle while I was getting ready to finish college caught up with me. Yeah. Um, and you know, like my lawyer said, that's I didn't even know what the term karma meant at the time, but. Uh, we had an opportunity to go to trial because uh, it was considered some legal experts can consider it an entrapment case mm-hmm. uh, because they had informants involved that did not know me that was using my name recklessly Yep. Uh, as if I had a por- former history with them. But as my attorney said, um, you know, this is what's called karma. Some of the things you did in the past, this is just the universe showing you that you had to pay the consequences. And I, 
I knew there was a, a, I'm not a religious guy, I'm a spiritual guy. And I felt like there was a bigger reasoning why my, here I am getting ready to finish college mm. and, and get into uh, a career in corporate America, as far as being, going down that pathway. I felt like something was just not right. And this was the universe bringing me in to really um, do a lot of evaluating and really to learn myself. Cause everybody, mm. people in the world think they know themselves. Uh, they think they know uh, themselves very, very much. But I feel like some of the humans that truly know themselves are those that are in isolation, yeah. um, that are either incarcerated or mm. soldiers at war that are in those barracks and shooting uh, across enemy lines. And they don't know if they're getting ready to get killed and uh, or, or other people that are just uh, in a situation where they don't have human contact. Yeah. You really get a chance to learn yourself on, yeah. on, a, on a personal level. Uh, and that was a really, uh, if I had to do it again, I would. Yeah, I tell people that all the time because it made me a better man. It helped wow. me do a lot of personal health, uh, self-development. A lot of, a lot of, uh, f- I found myself while I was in there in a lot of ways, from my physical uh, to my mental and spiritual. I grew, I really grew in there. Same with me. Mm-hmm. I served six months for firearm pr- possession at my when I was at my worst, and uh, it got me clear and sober, and I learned what it felt like to have nothing to have be stripped down and squatting over a mirror to have no 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 fundamental rights in there you yeah. are owned basically in there property yeah definitely yeah and you sir i, I served six months it was long enough for me to wake up <laughs> you said oh, so three- <laughs> some people serve six days and they could wake up I, like, I feel no. you. yeah 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 but more often than not you would know from being in the system yourself is that what can happen is people become institutionalized and they go back and then yeah. prison becomes home they know they know themselves and they're comfortable in prison. You, they don't want to leave. And so, but you really got something from it. Yeah. That was my first time ever being in car. So mm-hmm. I never had a speeding ticket up until that point and nothing no. like that. And you know, it was enough. Honestly, you could have gave me a week and I, I, I definitely, I, maybe I wouldn't have grown in a sense that the man that people know me today, Yeah. but I definitely wouldn't have went down the same path. Cause mm-hmm. again, I was ascending in general. Yeah. I was not one of those, guys just doing some criminal activity to do it or to be cool or mm. just go with the flow. I, I knew there was a better life out there and that I needed to take a, a path towards. And all the things I did up until that point was for survival. I yeah. had to do what I had to do and I was done. And it just so happened it finally came back up to me. I mean, obviously I was in college, so I had ambitions to be legit and yeah. do other things. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, this is, it's sad because a lot of the drug laws in America are set up to target specific groups of people. You know, first time offender, nonviolent offender. And here I am, had to yeah. go serve a time. I didn't, I didn't, and I'm not saying, look, I'm not making an excuse. I'm not crying about the situation, but there are people, our system is so fucked up right now. Yeah. Uh, there are people walking away uh, or doing 18 days in prison for a college scandal. <laughs> or uh, people that are doing a lot worse crimes, assault and violent crimes, walking away with one year versus those um, that you find in, in, in specific communities with a certain amount of drugs, uh, what's called the Rockefeller laws and the crack laws that really target uh, African Americans. I agree. There's uh, some people who are just psychologically dangerous to the community and they might do something that's violent, but they're just inherently violent people. They're not analyzed correctly. They get let back out with a suspended sentence and not inside and they're, they're back out in the streets. You get some people who continuously might, you know, do dri- cause driving offenses and they're in there for two years serving yeah. more time than this violent person who's back out in the streets. It's yeah, yeah. it really doesn't make any sense. But for you, the the biggest lesson you learned in prison was the isolation, or was it the? Did you have a pretty? Were you still in gangs at that time? Were you protected in there, or you on your own feet? It was a lot going on in there. Yeah. Um, not just isolation. I, I think the first two months was more isolation and really like still in shock. Like yeah, what the fuck am I? And and that's not because I felt like I was better than other inmates. You just get a sense of like how did I get here? You know, no. like I'm here. I was in college. I had a job. I was, I was legit. I was, you know, working, a straight, walking a straight path. And it's just, it's still like a, a shock because like you said, some people go in and out of jail from as a youth going yeah. in and out. I never went through that, that, that experience. You know, I sure I had homies that did and loved ones that did, but sometimes you just, 
I don't want to say you feel untouchable, but you feel like, why is this happening to me? I, and I think I think any decent human would feel that way at times, just yeah. trying to say like, why is this happening to me and stuff like that. And so that was like a, it was shock at first, and then yeah. you just settled into it, you know, settle into this whole different lifestyle, this whole different culture, this, this survival. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, so when you're in the feds, the feds are a lot different than the state. The state is more. You deal with a lot of uh, that's what they call gladiator school yeah. in, in in the U.S., especially in the Illinois state uh, prison system, where there's fighting and killings every day. Mm. Had a vice lords versus the disciples, and more versus the Latin kings, and all of that. Um, but in the feds, typically in the U.S. system, those are criminals. Eighty percent of them are was at their at the at the top of their organization yeah. or at the top whatever crime they was doing is pretty serious enough where you have not the people of uh, Illinois or, or the people of London versus you. It's, it's like the people of the whole country. Versus the people of the United States of America versus you. That's a pretty scary document. Yeah. And it's a, a pretty, pretty uh, uh, scary thing to see the U.S. government come at you as if you are a terrorist. If, yeah. if you are, they don't want you in your own country. Like you yep. f- they really, uh, they really come at you hard <laughs> in yep. that sense. Um, and so when you're in there, you're in there with, kingpins you're in there with um you know, people executive former executives that did a lot of embezzlement and more mm-hmm. um you're in there with a, a bunch of different people mm-hmm. um so that experience too also helps shape you in a way because yep. you see Jane, john doe is in here in here for tax fraud invasion and stuff like this versus this other john doe is in here for getting caught with 100 kilos or this other john doe was part of the cartel. Yeah, getting he was actually a plant grower in in South America, and and he got extracted to the U.S. They, you know, different different reasons and stuff. Now, now you then there were a bunch of colorful, different people, and you all become like family. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, y'all, you y'all you kind of like mm, because this is it's the Fed. The one thing I say about the Feds again, state, you can get out easy, and state is more petty crimes, but Feds is you sitting down for a long time. I I was coming in there with. There's guys 18. They went in there when it was 18 on a conspiracy charge coming home when it was like 30 years old. Because conspiracy charges in the U.S. is the worst because mm. they don't need evidence. Suspicion? No. Yeah. Yeah. They don't. They don't. They they just need a little bit of evidence. But uh, once they once you're part of that org chart, that organization chart, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's a a trickle effect. They got all you guys. They were whipping all you guys. That was to there. get the mafia originally, wasn't it? Uh, part of the Rico yeah. is it yeah. the Rico? Yeah, a lot yeah. of those. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a combination of both. Yeah, but also to target also again gang members or, and or organizations. Yeah, Black Panthers, all of yep. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very clever of them just to bring in a new yeah, specific it's, it's law. A, it was very strategic. Yeah, uh, in a lot of sense to do that, and they use it to their advantage to this day. To still tear down they use it to their, they can use it to their, their discretion absolutely literally. yeah yeah absolutely and they they can take down someone's baby mother or girlfriend yeah. when she didn't know anything about it but you living with that person and guilty they, by association yeah they can bring in people for that yeah, yeah they did yeah. the same thing in australia with the outlawed uh, motorcycle gangs okay made it made it uh, a crime for them to affiliate with each other or any so they couldn't even affiliate with friends or otherwise they would get in trouble so it was a way, a way to break up the the gangs it, it worked but what it did is just made them more underground and smarter so it didn't i don't think it solved the problem but it did work on dispersing a lot of the the gangs and made it a little bit less sort of alluring to people to join yeah um i've got this quote from you i think it's just a very interesting quote you said if i can go plant based in prison anyone kind of can is that yeah, so when I said it, that that's a actually that's an older quote. It's an um, older quote. Yeah, it's a little bit of an older quote. Uh, but when I said that, that was me explaining to those that are in a position of privilege. Okay, you know what I mean. Yeah. That um, if you can, if I can do it in prison, which I did, uh, we didn't. It's not like I went in there like, oh, you're vegan. You have yeah. this option. <laughs> no, it's none of no. that. That no, it's not. No. It's not like that. It's the system is not set up to serve you and your dietary um uh, they make it uh, hard for you no they make it very hard for you yeah. um but i i ate a lot of carbs yep. complex and simple carbs and i would trade my meat protein with my cellies uh in exchange for more carbs yeah. and i would also buy more carbs off a of commissary uh so my point was if i can sustain and go plant-based in prison uh someone 
uh, in the world, in the free world, yeah, uh, that are that are, are in a position of privilege. I'm not talking about people that in tribes uh, or like in you know they they or homeless or don't. Have well, a, yeah, exactly. Yeah, when you're yeah. talking about the, the homeless community, uh, that's a whole delicate situation yeah. and a different situation. And you're also talking about people that are just it's an educational component missing where they yeah. just don't know. Like you can certainly. Because uh, you see so many vegans like, well, beans and rice is very inexpensive and all that. But you're missing the point of that person being educated about beans and rice. You know, of course. Knowing, knowing that, uh, yeah, sure, beans and rice is a lot cheaper than uh, a pork chop or steak, you know. Yeah. But they're conditioned to believe they need that meat and that, and that protein. It's another specific. element. It's a lot of different complex complexities there that people don't stop to consider for so sure. you, you but convenience is a is just a justification a lot of people use and what you were saying is it was more inconvenient for you in prison in america Correct. so you have less you excuses out there you hit on it now it's yeah a, it was inconvenient for me in prison for those of you that have the convenience to go plant-based what's your excuse especially in this day and age now where you're receiving the information the science is there yeah. when i when i went plant-based uh, when i stopped eating meat 19 years ago we we didn't have social media. We didn't have documentaries. No. We didn't have influencers and nothing like that. So what did you have? How did you make this connection? Did you make this connection in prison? I made the connection in prison. Yeah, my first week there. I uh, um, I was trying to figure out, again, as earlier on when I said that, what am I doing here? You know, this yeah. was part of my, my journey, my search, uh, for trying to find an understanding of why I was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, and... I was in my cell. I remember it like it was yesterday, uh, my first weekend uh, in my cell by myself. I, sh I shared a cell with another guy, but he was outside the cell um, at the time. And I got down on my knees um, and I opened up my heart to the universe um, in a sense of prayer, in a sense of communicating uh, uh, to um, a higher energy, a higher source, trying to understand why um, did I get placed in this scenario? Mm -hmm. And everything pointed to this childhood memory. Uh, right then and there, it's just like this information came into my head when I was eight years old. My mother used to feed us chicken wings because um, that's all she could afford. She could only afford chicken wings and pork chops. Mm -hmm. And it was this once in, and up until that point, I was a very picky eater. Yeah. And I would always analyze and look at any meat I was being served is like, where does it come from? And it, it, and I never questioned it up until that day. Wow. So when she put the chicken wings in front of me, because every time I would eat chicken wings, I would always go through the cartilage and just get to the little meat part and, and remove it from the uh, from the tendons and all of that. I, I was not one of those like, mm, you know, you, you see people eat yeah, chicken yeah, wings. Suck the whole, suck yeah. the whole thing. Savage. That yeah, was never yeah. like that. That yeah. was never me. I was just like this. <laughs> yeah. Like a true carnival. Yeah. Not. <laughs> uh, right. I was just like, mm, let me just carefully uh, <laughs> just carve out this part, you know. Uh, but up in that point, I was looking at the wings. Then I looked at my mother. Then I looked at the wings, and I looked at my arms, then I looked back at the wings, and I pushed back. I said, I don't want this. And she looked at the wings, looked at me, and she's like, what do you mean? I was like, I can't eat that. She's like, why? I was like, they look like little bitty arms. Whoa. And that kind of shocked her. You know what I mean? She was like, huh. Uh, and my mom is very outspoken, yeah. uh, and she's no nonsense in that sense. And you can't waste food in our household. Mm. And she's like, well, then you're not going to eat. But she raised me to be like her, and I voiced my opinion, like, well, then I'm not going to eat. Yeah. Um, so she seen I wasn't going to eat. Eventually, you know, we, we bumped heads, and she eventually compromised and went out to the store uh, to buy me fish sticks. <laughs> so I, I, I grew up eating a lot of fish sticks or even... So it was, con it was kind of disguised. Yeah, right yeah. It was a visual aid thing. It yeah, was like yeah, a yeah. visual disconnect where... You put it in, you 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 wrap it up uh, aesthetically to look appealing. I yeah. was okay with it. Yeah. But if it's attached to a bone, I'm questioning it. So that wow. memory, like instantly, came into my head, and I thought to myself, okay, I, I get it, I get it. Like because I didn't push the the issue when I was eight, and I all of this was going in my head. Even what my lawyer said, this is karma. You got to make these connections and stuff like that. And I felt like I'm a I'm a firm believer of karma in the sense of this i don't care if you're an eight-year-old dominic or you're an 80 year old dominic when the universe shows you something in the sense of you know you know it we all been in those scenarios yeah. 
whether it be a food thing or a violent situation or a bad relationship or a job decision where you're going to have an impact on customers, whatever. We all been in those scenarios where we know that's not right. Yeah. You should not be doing that. And if the universe shows you that and you don't fall through with it and make the right decision, I feel like it's going to pay you back in yeah. some sense. It may pay you back in the form of a disease, incarceration, financial issues, who knows, whatever. You're gonna, It's going to eventually come back to you. And I felt this was the universe showing me that, yeah, you that eight-year-old Dominic, you should have continued to follow through with that journey. And now you're here, and this is what I want you, what I needed to understand. This was part of my growth. Sounds like you had an epiphany in there. I did. I, I did. I had a spiritual reset in there. And that's when I, right then and there, I created this mantra for myself that if it requires harm, then no, nah, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Meaning I didn't want to have anything to do with an industry that was destroying over 50 billion animals per year. And also I didn't want to have a, um, be a part of a, another billion dollar industry that was also destroying people in a sense of narcotics and drugs and plants. I didn't want yeah. to go into none of that. I didn't want to hurt nobody anymore. So I did a hard reset and I never looked back. So that's when I decided to stop the meat. Amazing. Uh, that is an absolutely amazing story that you made this connection without a video or seeing yeah. it. You just... Yeah. And you had this epiphany. That's absolutely like you, there was no preacher to you preaching veganism nah, to you, nah, like to help. Nah, this you. is this is like, man, dude. This is like close to twenty years ago. Eight, like I said, eighteen, twenty years ago, where we didn't have this information. Oh. Like, and even even still, I was unsure. Like, what the hell was gonna happen to my body? You know, like I, I was, and at the time, I, I dope boys, what what they call dope boys these days, but I was. I wasn't fat and obese, but I was definitely overweight. I was like mm. 200 and over 250 pounds. Wow. And when I removed that meat out of my diet within the first two months, I dropped all the way down to like 200, you know, like instantly, like after two months. Like, and I wasn't sure like, oh, shit. I, again, I, I, was, I was ignorant to the food and nutrition side yeah. because, again, we didn't have information yeah. out there. We've been programmed to believe protein only comes from one source, and that's animals. Yeah. And here I am shriveling up a little bit like you know just shrinking but not realizing i'm actually my body is transforming to what it should look like without the inflammation and more yeah this is what it should be you yeah know? but also in the same sense i became stronger you know in the sense because i started working out doing push-ups got to keep your mind busy started i jumped in the car with the guy with uh, a couple of my uh, cellmates and others we call it the cars four of us in the car every every workout group in the prison system on a cop on a pound on a yard had a car. It was either three men to a car or up to five men to a car. Usually the sweet spot is four men. And you all will work like clockwork. You yeah. get you get down, for example, on the bench. While you bench and one person is spot, another person is supersetting that second routine and you all switch and it's just like a circuit going all the way around. And that was yep. my car. That was my my uh, my my brotherhood right there in that sense. And I just started excelling like like just getting stronger and stronger um where they was just looking at me like oh what are you cr- doing differently to us yeah yeah well i mean he, they knew i didn't eat meat yeah and i was like that's that crazy that's that weirdo you yeah, know like yeah. that's that's crazy that he's able to and could we will have what's called liftoffs and in that scenario specifically out of over a thousand inmates in the system i was in the top 10 wow because i was benching 405 like it was nothing i was deadlifting over 500 pounds like it was nothing wow. i was squatting up to 500 pounds like it was nothing just like mm, mm, like clockwork you know and uh i i gotta believe it's really because uh i personally believe it was because of not only my spiritual awakening but the diet too yeah. you know what i mean it really had a different because i didn't have inflammation and my recovery was a lot more better yeah. um it was just it was it was interesting to see me transform and see my body just sh- ripped this fuck like abbed yeah. up everywhere i had probably less than five percent fat uh it was just crazy so you were like a vegan advocate in prison kind of thing well you were like well you're still eating dairy and eggs and, and those well yeah things. so yeah. so i was vegetarian yeah and, and not by definition meaning like you know, it's not like I can see the box of cereal that they serve in the morning and it has whey in it. I, yeah. I didn't know it had or yeah. dairy in it, stuff like that. It's not like they give you like, hey, Dominic, you want to read mm. the ingredients right here before we serve it on the line? You know, so it's not like I can see that. So even the pasta, the pasta that they would serve on the line, if it had cheese or dairy in it, I had no control of that. No. But I also didn't know about the dairy industry. No. Again, my ignorance, a lot of people, you can ask vegetarians at the time, 
um, you know, vegetarianism was kind of closely associated with veganism, but a lot of vegetarianism, vegetarians were strong advocates for animals because they felt like, well, dairy is dairy. You're not, nothing's happening to that animal. Oh, you yeah. know, back then, and of course, you can't get away with that now. <laughs> but back then, we didn't have the information about what was happening to uh, the dairy with those cows with mm. respect to uh, the artificial insemination, uh, basically the raping and then mm. torturing and destroying of the animals yeah. and more. We didn't have access to that information. Um, so whatever they served on the line that had maybe eggs in it from the bread to the dairy, I would eat and stuff like that. But if it was like a meat product specifically, mm, I couldn't do it. You know. Yeah, uh, and and the meat they serve in prisons is very questionable. It's not. It's like, very questionable, yeah. especially in the feds. They yeah. were serving buffalo meat from Desert Storm when the when the uh, when the storm was over. A lot of leftover food was boxed and placed in cans yeah. and preserved, and and filled with chemicals and more, uh, and shipped off to a lot of the uh, prison system. And there was so much of it, and they put it in the freezers, that inmates was eating that shit yeah. five ten years later, frozen. Oh just defrosted. When I went from high security to medium security, I could buy um, fruits and vegetables from the commissary. And, and that was so I had someone from the outside putting some money in my account and I was just getting eating mainly raw fruits and vegetables. And yeah. I'd have chicken breast and skim milk powder because I thought protein, protein, protein. But I had a different different influence. I was influenced by a raw foodist. Okay. So I was like 90% raw. Okay. And then these other things, I was like, I need protein. I don't want to be skinny sure. like him. And so I had the similar type yeah, of... Made a, so you made a connection there too. Huh? And, and... Yeah. The, the, the connection to the animals was kind of there. I wasn't firm on it until yeah. I was released and I had a reflection upon my release. Sure. But, but I... The thing that prison did for me was sobriety because I was a, I was a drug dealer. I was also a drug user, and, gotcha. I, get, and I was predisposed to addiction. And prison got me sober like that. Yeah. And so I was focusing on raw plant foods, and people used to laugh at me. I'd be eating carrots and all this in the, yeah. you know, in the unit. But I feel like incorporating more plant food did something to my consciousness. It made me more aware of what was going on and the gangs in there. And, and it, I just had, it was like a progressive sort of awakening. And I think like being healthier gave me more clarity and sobriety to sort sure. of see these mistakes. And I think a lot of people don't, uh, we, we in this community a lot of times do advocate for how amazing the diet makes us feel. But I think a lot of people don't make, make that connection and advocate for how much it does up here too, yeah. mentally. Like it yeah. really changed your state of mind. Yeah. Um, you, you, you're less, you're less prone to be violent for those that are violent. Not that say I was a violent guy. I mean, again, I had, I had a temper at times, but I, I was able to control it in a lot of senses. Um, but you just respond differently to every different scenario that yeah. you come across. You know, you really, uh, at least for me personally, um, um, I, I just respond a lot differently than yeah. I was when I was eating meat based for sure. Yeah. Even as far as problem solving and stuff. Uh, me myself like i was a violent person okay. generally i was a violent uh, drug dealer i was a violent gang member uh, i i sp like snap and do something really violent yeah and, um i was also eating a lot of animal products i kind of make that correlation i know it's not scientific but as, since i've been vegan i haven't assaulted anyone i haven't you know i might have like a feeling of being pissed off which is normal yeah but i don't act on that anger yeah i mean i also got sober so yeah. that was another thing stopped eating animal products and left gangs and left those influences i wasn't in a survival situation anymore in a sense so i think all of those factors coming in together um yeah uh, well, so and how, if i how long have you been vegan now i've been vegan for six years six now. years okay yeah. and so you still find a little bit of that anger uh, um blocked, blocked it's off. really um it's there every yeah. now and then, yeah. But it's nowhere near what what I, it was when it first when you first I, went. I could smash a bottle on someone's face or stick yeah. a knife in someone's leg or like I was yeah. really violent, and that was how I dealt with my emotion and you yeah. know, tried to survive. And I've it's never come to that point where I'm like I would do what I had to do if someone tried to attack me or my family. For sure, yeah. Anyone be, would, but you had but to be I'd, reactive. Yeah. I've never thought I'm gonna actually act out. Yeah. That anger on someone yeah you know? yeah like conspire to do it yeah like yeah premeditated yeah. premeditated yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so yeah of course there's situations where there's been someone yelling in my face i've got adrenaline and like dude but like never like i used to plot it out yeah and just be like yeah i'm yeah. gonna get this <laughs> yeah, like yeah, for weeks yeah. and months and a year like you could have done something to me two years before that and i would have thought about it you know and it would still be still be gunning for someone so yeah that that side of me is definitely i think what it, for me was 
you know, it's like a muscle, this compassion mus- muscle, like where you're like showing compassion to different types of animals and different species of animals and chickens, or, you know, and fish. And you're like, I would never want to hurt a fish, you know. I would never, I, I used to drag fish out the ocean and kick them around and stuff. I never thought of that. Yeah. Um, so I think that for me, showing compassion to animals, it started to like flow out into human beings more. That's good. I mean, yeah. cause I, I feel like a lot of, you know, I've been in this community a long time. I mean, I've been advocating for animals even in prison. Yeah. You know, I was advocating, um, telling people, they are like, why you don't do that? I was like, it makes no sense. Like, if you look at our hands, this is engineered for picking, yeah. not for clawing. And so that's a, another reason why it was very easy for me yeah. just to go into this lifestyle. But I see a lot of uh, vegans, um, a lot of people in our community, uh, especially those that are like in the very new stage, the newbies, are yeah. very aggressive and very... Uh, can turn a little bit more violent. That was or, me. Yeah. <laughs> I was an aggressive well, I mean, I, Think about it. It's like you've been in the Matrix and you got uh, lifted and mm. all of a sudden you realize, oh, shit, I've been lied to. You feel betrayed yeah. by society. Like, you get know, your you hands like, off that animal. <laughs> yeah, but you feel betrayed yeah. in general. Definitely. Like, you know, mm. because you, you felt like this whole time you thought you was a decent person or if you would know you was a shitty person, it doesn't matter, but you just felt like any, nobody likes to be deceived in yeah. no sense. So you just see a lot of people aggressively acting out and that's nothing wrong with being an advocate and being involved in activism but my problem and one thing i would hope the community starts to realize we should be more assertive not aggressive because yeah. 90 over 90 percent of us used to eat meat we wasn't born yeah. in, the, in our belly of our moms and came out with this jedi vegan sword and say hey leave animals alone like you're the second coming or something (laughs) you know what i mean like and and so when we make that connection and have that empathy i think we can connect more with people and i'm not not saying being apologetic about their um, poor habits and lifestyles but Mm -hmm. educate them assertively Mm -hmm. not shamefully because you see a lot of people that call their uh call some stranger or some woman on the street everything in a book from a fur whore to a fur hag and slap them with a sticker but they wouldn't do the same to their own mother who's not mm-hmm. vegan or to their own sister. You realize that woman is someone's mother or someone's sister or mm-hmm. someone's lover and partner. So I think we just need to make that connection a little yeah. bit more. I would like to see that connection a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I agree. I never, well, what I used to do was when I was talking to a camera, I was a lot more full on than if I was actually talking to someone on the street. Yeah. And then I started to make that, I was like, wait a second. So there's just a bunch of people that are like technically on a street, just watching me on the screen and I'm acting like this. Yeah. But if I'm face to face with someone, I'll talk to them more respectfully. Yeah. So then I started to incorporate the respectful part to my advocacy online. And I complete, I deleted about a hundred of my videos. That's what's up. That's yeah, good. yeah. It's good. You're, you're growing and you're yeah. evolving. And that's why I think none of us is, there's no handbook. And none of us perfect, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there's no handbook and none mm. of us perfect. There's a lot of great ways to do activism from mm. street activism to online activism to going into institutions and mm. educating them on an academic level. Um, I always say this community is like, it's like the Justice League's crash with the Avengers. You have different capes and different uniforms. I might not like that blue cape or that yellow cape or that superhero. I might like the red cape better or whatever. Yep. But we all doing something and, and we're not remaining silent. But I just think it's more effective to be um, uh, compassionate towards humans because humans are animals too. And we make yeah. mistakes too. That's you know? a big one there. Yeah. Humans are animals too. Yeah. When I realized people that, don't make I was, that. No. People don't make that connection. At yeah, all. no, no. Yeah. Um, I do think aggression is somewhat subjective because being assertive, you could be assertive to someone on the street and yep. then there will be a percentage of people would say you're too aggressive yeah and then they could push you into a corner where you're not even sure. saying anything like yeah but even on the street so if you meet a jane doe or a john doe on the street they may not just identify with you you know like for example mm-hmm. you being a, a male of non-color if you go into the hood especially in the states um and try to communicate that to somebody a corner board they might they might get violent with you. They might who the fuck are you? Like Come you know in. what I mean? Like yeah. so it's it's really the communicator, you know, so we have to use that to our advantage. You have some people in the community that can go into a different community to educate yeah. while others can't. Some people can go into an Ivy League school because they have multiple degrees and those students will have more respect for them yeah. than maybe somebody like you and I that came off the street. You yeah, like you could, you could go into a prison and be like, I've done three years and yeah. you know, this is what I think. And then people are going to be like straight away, oh, he knows what it's like to be in here. Right. Yeah. It, it, correct. Exactly. So I, we had to we had to strategically use those voices to commit, connect to those communities yeah. and then we can have a big uh, 
change. You can you can never pander to everyone. You can't. You can only you can. have your demographic, and and there's always going to be people that don't appreciate you. There's going to be a lot that do, and yeah, yeah, and don't feel defeated about it. Mm. I think that some people think just because they haven't connected with somebody, and that's when they start calling them a name. You're not going to win every battle. You're not no. going to convince everybody because human beings are visual creatures, and some people aspire to look like others mm. that look like them. Or they want to listen to someone that looks like them. That's the problem with like white supremacy and stuff like that. They don't want to listen to nobody of color. They they rather listen to a male that looks like them that understands them. Um, it's just so many problems in that sense. Yeah, yeah. It's all about perception, and there can be so many different sort of people advocating, and still people think there's just there's just one way. And I think that's a. a a big mistake because there's some people that don't talk about animals at all mm -hmm. right and they might just be doing this bodybuilding thing and sure. plant-based eating and people might have a go at them oh, you're not talking about animals and then i like try to remind them that the person who inspired me rarely talked about animals he wasn't even a vegan he was a raw food advocate and he was talking about the power of plants and i did a juice fast and lost all this weight and i started and he's just talked about karma a bit. Oh, you're eating the suffered animal once. And so I was inspired by someone who wasn't even a, now I'm a full blown animal rights activist, sure. you know? Sure. Yeah. Mm. And that's 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 interesting of a transition. You mm. made a connection of other other ways. I, I meet a lot of people in our community that probably went for health reasons or environmental reasons. And mm. a lot of those people are even going back to the health reason and bodybuilding, some people consider them vain, but then they made the connections from the ethical standpoint. Yeah. And you know, I think no matter why, like I, I admit secretly years and years ago, I mean, I'm, I consider myself an ethical vegan. I went, uh, um, I stopped eating meat for the animals. Yeah. Um, I didn't do it to look a certain way. We didn't have environmental issues going on. The last thing a young guy for me, a kid from Chicago was thinking about was the fucking environment. No. But as I grown into my advocacy and I grown into activism in general, it, it's a beautiful thing, even if they stop doing it to look a certain way, because at the end of the day, they stopping animals from being yeah. destroyed. So let them have at it. If that if that's their reason for doing it, who are we to shame them or talk shit about them no. for going for that reason? The more reasons, the better. Yeah. And the more inclusive this community can become. Specifically, yeah. yeah sure, there are different terminologies we can use: vegan versus plant based. Mm. But we're still a very young community yeah. and criticizing and being aggressive in that sense is only going to turn people off from the community. We need all the wins we can get. And this could just be a ticket in for them to, you know, Absolutely. they could become an animal advocate. Yeah, they, they could. Yeah. It's just all the tickets in to this, you know, well, they, they, all the tickets yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And some people just don't make that connection. Yeah. 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 You talk about something, compassionate masculinity. I'm really curious about this. Do you want to speak about that? Yeah. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing now here in 2019. Historically, what you consider masculine was eating hamburgers or um, uh, driving the most updated car. Again, we can talk about different cultures in that sense, but the way they target men back in the day compared to, and they still do target them today. Mm -hmm. You see it on all types of commercials and mm -hmm. billboards. You know, you're hungry, eat a steak. Um, or look at the movies where the superheroes are doing all types of things. And then that actor, sometimes we don't remove that actor from that uh, person that they're playing. And we look at it, oh, that's The Rock or that's uh, Batman eating a burger outside of that role of the movie yeah. and stuff like that. A lot of that has influences on young kids and stuff like that. But now we have social media where... We don't have to rely on the media influence of outsiders mm -hmm. or movies and more because kids are opening up their phones instead of opening up a TV. Kids are opening up their phones instead of running to the next movie. And they see people like me, you, and other men in this community um, that are redefining what it means to be masculine mm -hmm. and show compassion. You can mm -hmm. show compassion to animals and human animals. You can protect and speak out about these things without being viewed as a, femi a feminine person. And there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with being a feminist, too. Mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly inspiring mm -hmm. uh, to see this new age of men uh, truly become what they are meant to be, protectors, mm -hmm. uh, educators, uh, and, and even greater than what men of yesterday was. Wow. Do you think there's more stigma on men uh, with in terms of showing compassion and showing emotion? Um, 
Yeah, I, I think that's still there in yeah. a sense, like don't show compassion or don't show emotion Sweetness. or you, cons- you consider uh, weak. Mm-hmm. Uh, even some women still are disconnected and they will consider they don't want to. Oh, I don't want a weak guy and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't think there's nothing wrong with wearing your emotions outside on your sleeve, per se, mm-hmm. uh, meaning like communicating your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that's the only way we're going to get from point A to point B to point C to point D. If you mm. communicate, if you keep that bottled up, you know, there's no telling what can happen if that person's triggered in the wrong way. They may explode and it may explode in a very violent way. You know, yeah. so I think it's incredibly important for us to communicate our thoughts as men and women um, as mm. well as human beings yeah. uh, about what we feel is right and what we feel is wrong. So what do you think about uh, some of the negative consequences of bottling things up? <laughs> In terms of what not it can do, not bottling emotions up, but men, but that don't aren't open. Yeah, I, I, I think it can definitely have an impact on you mentally. Mm. Um, I am from that timeline where you don't communicate your feelings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I even grew up in a household where I didn't. You, you don't get hugs and stuff like that. You get out there and do what you got to do. Like, yeah, my mother was an OG. You know, what I mean, just because yeah. she was a woman, she still was a gangster. You know, yeah. what I mean, in a lot of ways. And, yeah. Um, and you just deal with your own problems and solve it on your own and stuff like that. Um, but it's not good. Mm-hmm. It's not good for your mental health. It's good to pro- talk about your problems um, because you have communities and sub communities out there that are going through similar stuff. Especially if you got a large platform. Yeah. Show that you it, human, it humanizes you, make you likable, makes you relatable. Yeah. When you say, yeah, I had a fucking shitty day. Yeah. I had a fucking shitty year. Like, and I'm going on record if we ever see this. This has been a challenging year for me personally in a yeah. lot of different ways and stuff like that. I'm not perfect what you see online. Uh, and I talk about that a lot. I yep. tell people and I think that helps. And that's what that's the that's the positive of social media when you can be social about those issues and talk about that uh, to communities because you never know who you may inspire to do something better or stop somebody from doing something maybe suicidal. You know? yeah, yeah, that's so powerful. Um, I've recently... I've uh, been in PTSD therapy for a lot of things I saw in my past and a lot of things I did and, you know, a lot of things I feel guilty about. And you've seen a lot of uh, crazy things as a youth. You said you've yeah, seen your first seen murder at five. Yeah. How did you spiritually overcome those traumas? Did you have trauma? I I, I was the first murder. Like I said, we were sitting in the car. This, this guy... He ran a red light and hit this little girl that was crossing the street. And the gang, it was the Vice Lords right there, specifically the TVLs. Um, 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 They seen uh, her. She went up about 10 feet in the air, 10, 15 feet in the air, landed. She was in shock. She got up and ran across the street. But it was a drunk driver. He kept driving, and they ran out. And at that time, they had Uzis, uh, automatic, like uh, semi-Uzis, classic Uzis and sprayed him, like, you know, because he kept going. Um, and, you know, they called themselves protecting the hood, protecting yep. the community. They knew that little girl, you know what I mean? Like, And this and this wasn't a gang of older guys. This was probably a gang of, like, 17, 18 wow. young men, you know, running, spraying up that car, and you can just see his brains, blah, 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 you know. Um, so I, I think, and then my mom, I was in the car, my mom, she's like, get out, get out, like, you just hit that pop, 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 all of that. Uh, it was shocking at first, but then it just started becoming a way of life. You know, you walk home and see somebody getting off on a corner for being shortchanged or anything like that. You walk in the alleyway, see dump bodies and shit. Like, it just became the norm, man, for yeah. some scenarios like that, you know. Uh, or you'll hear about it, and we moved into a better neighborhood, but still... It, uh, you'll see other things too, you know, and, and it, it just never, it just became the norm for me. Just a better neighborhood didn't mean a good neighborhood. It means right. better. <laughs> well, it just means a, a, a better living conditions and um, less violent. In less violent. Sense. Yeah, 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 less violent, yeah. So did you deal with any of those traumas growing up or you just dealt with them yourself or did you get any therapy for that? Or I didn't get any therapy. Into, uh, so I end up going into playing football. You okay. know, uh, my mother felt like, I should, you know, I gravitated naturally to playing football too. I just wanted to play something. And I, at times, uh, 
not not when we lived down there. I, won't, cause I never had a, my own bedroom. And then we when we moved into a different area, I finally had my own bedroom. We still stayed in an apartment. So I, I grew up without a house and yard and all that shit. I still grew up in an apartment unit type of thing. And uh, up until that one point, I finally had uh, my own private area. I had to get through that area, get to my sister's room to get to that area. But it was a storage unit. <laughs> my mom did what she can. She converted the storage unit into a bedroom for me. Um, and I would take my anger out. Uh, and I don't think it was from seeing the violence. I just think it was a lot of just me coming to age trying to figure out my belonging in society. Yeah. And I didn't have a male really to sit down one on one to talk to me on those in that in that development area. I had males that was showing me about fast money or doing that type of thing mm -hmm. when I described my cousins and all of that. Mm -hmm. But not to really sit down to talk to me about a lot of critical things. So at times, especially uh when my father tried to come back into our, in my life, you know, he'll say, I'll come pick you up and, and stuff like that and never showed up. You know, and I would get mad. That that triggered me and I would just like drill holes in my mother's walls. And that's when I decided to um, get into football. My mother bought me my first um, um, weight bench when I was in fifth grade. Um, it was a Joe Weider bench, and I would hit the weights. In, in fifth grade, this little 10, 11-year-old hitting <laughs> weights and playing junior football, and I and I destroyed on that field. I took all my anger out on that field, you know, in that sense. Like, you know, just took it out on the other kids on the field and they really excelled in football um so that's i i kind of dealt with i guess if you want to say trauma on the field yeah uh and then i started drinking when i was 13 um and this one scenario where um my mother asked me to go see a therapist you know because she couldn't get through to me in a lot of different senses and stuff because, uh, again, I'm still a teenager. I'm like 12, 13 at the time. And her colleague, my mother was a nurse, so this was a free service. Like, her colleague was like, my mother felt like I was, she was afraid of my future. You yeah. Because think of all the shit she's seen growing up. And me being where I'm from, us kids, we didn't know we was going to make it to the age of 18. And, and we'll be happy if we made it to the age of 21, 25. That's the state of mind that all of us was in. You lose that, a lot of friends. Yeah, I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of homies from murder to prison and more. Mm -hmm. So that state of mind was always there. Yeah. So I went to go see this therapist one time. My mother begged me to go see her. And I seen her that one time. And she asked me about my problems, what was going up. And it was a white woman. And at the end of the session, she didn't give me no solution. She was like, okay, we'll talk next week. And I was like, that's it? Like, yeah. you just want me to talk to you about my problems? And, and she couldn't identify with me. Yeah. She's a white woman. She couldn't know nothing about me and my, my culture and what I was going through. And I went home and told my mother about it. And I was like, you know, I'm not never going back to that. Because my mother asked me just to try it one time. If I don't like it, I don't have to go back. Okay. And, I, and I never looked back. That was the only experience I had with a therapist. And it was so happened that that little experience was able to get my lawyer to put me in the drug program in prison to say I had a a drinking problem that gave me more time off my sentence. Cause I was supposed to be in there for five years. I had a hard year, five year, and pretty much a five year release, supervised house arrest sentence. So that reduced my sentence when I was getting involved in a drug program. So that helped. Something good came out of it. Something then. good came out of that. <laughs> that medical record chart. That, that's just something good came out of that. But yeah, uh, in terms of we, we dealt with trauma differently. A yeah. lot of us growing up, we did. It seems like a, uh, some people are affected by trauma differently too. You've always been had a strong mindset. You seem very, you know, cool, calm, and collected. For me, I, exercise didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Exercise didn't do it. it. It started to manifest in different forms of my behavior, and I'd get mm -hmm. triggers and reminders. And so I did need a good, solid year of therapy, and it was uh, hard to trust someone with all the deepest, darkest parts of yourself and yeah it was a big step forward in my evolution for sure did it help it one like i'd say i'm 70 percent better yeah than where like there's some things that will never leave you yeah but i do think it helped just revisiting them and just processing them yeah because yeah. when you sometimes when something full-on happens you don't have time to process it or no your your friends are just like whatever dude yeah you, hard up, you know life is fast you, you run it yeah just, put it down there yep. and you forget about it keep and, it moving yeah. and then it comes back up like yeah. something might trick you might hear a noise you might be in a crowded place and you might be like well what's going to happen here yeah so uh, it was a real 
big uh, like I do recommend it for those who find the right person exactly. and who need it and there's different modalities for therapy especially trauma therapy for so. sure for sure mm-hmm. I agree with you to those that are listening to this like it's good it's nothing wrong with seeking out help yeah you're not viewed as weak no you know when you seek out help or talk about your problems you definitely should yeah um, I think it's a strength yeah like, it's a strength to yeah. be able to do that yeah yeah for sure mm-hmm. I think the only the, I, so we're talking about trauma it's funny the only thing that I I, I, I can't get rid of, uh, and <laughs> I don't care. And I talk to, I publicly talk about this a lot is I have, so in my apartment, I have a, a, a trap. What's it? They call it a, a door trap where you put the, uh-huh. right under the doorknob so yeah. nobody can't push it in. Yeah. Cause I still, prison has such an impact being incarcerated yeah. and in those conditions that to this day, it used to be very vivid. I used to dream all, t- all the time that I was still locked up. Mm-hmm. Now it's probably once every three or four months. But I, I don't want to be caught off guard by the, the feds coming in my door. Like, no, you got to give us some more time. So I still put that trap <laughs> in front of my dog. <laughs> You're not uh, kicking this one in. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to hear it coming. You yeah, just want, yeah. I want to be prepared. I don't want to be caught off guard and mm-hmm. I'm in the bed and boom, lights on me and stuff like that. Okay. But not to say that the feds are coming at me, mm-hmm. but my point is it's, it's a sense of security. And also, I mean, uh, Atlanta, Georgia is known for a lot of home invasions, just no matter yep. the neighborhood. You can live in Definitely. a good neighborhood, bad neighborhood. It's just known for home invasions. They come from the bad neighborhood to get to the good neighborhood. They and do. Go, they, 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 they do can, both. Yeah, they, they do both. They, they yeah. do both. So that's still there, yeah. Just yeah. the fact, just so you guys know, I still deal with, that's a trauma I deal with to this day. Yeah thinking sometimes I have a dream that I'm still incarcerated yeah. for sure. It did have an impact on me. Yeah. Um, and I'd, it depends on how much it affects your life, whether how much treatment you would need for that. But it seems like you got things locked down. Yeah. 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 When you wake, I mean, I wake up, I'm like, okay, that was a dream. You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and I talk about it openly and stuff yeah. like that, but some things don't leave you, you mm-hmm. know, some things just don't leave you. Yeah. I agree. So, Look, uh, you're a big guy. You have a nutri- is it a nutrition program called Eat What Elephants yeah, Eat? Yeah, yeah, Eat What Elephants Eat for sure. You are definitely a big dude. <laughs> now, do you want to talk about a little bit about that program and sure. then go into a little bit about what you eat? Yeah, so over the last, I've been on a speaking tour, um, like hardcore for the mm-hmm. last five, six years specifically advocating and educating in uh, universities to vegan events to mm-hmm. conferences you name it as far as like publicly not what i was doing internally but i was causing all this disruption and mm-hmm. people when they meet me and they see me uh they're like holy shit you really are big you know like yeah. versus like you know people have ways to make themselves look bigger online and stuff yeah. like that but then people meet me in person like you're a big dude uh and it inspires them uh, men or women to want to eat plant based, those omnivores. And it's like, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. They'll listen. They're like, I'm ready to go. So I was causing all this disruption, even the disruption I was causing online. Because at that point, too, um, like, I don't know how long you've been um, in that space of social media yourself, but there was one point when Instagram first came out because I was on it very early. Mm-hmm. I had the largest vegan mail account at the time. Wow. And it had a lot, and it was organically, it wasn't through. No any of these other ways these kids do with buying followers or re-sharing each other, just organically growing. And that's a whole different story we can get into. Um, But my point is I was causing this disruption, um, but with no solution. I I can tell them like, hey, go here, go there, or go to this program here, or go to this website here. But a lot of those websites I didn't vet. I didn't have a chance to vet. And they'll come back like, dude, it's just – who is this guy, this girl, or this mm-hmm. person telling me how to eat? And they don't look like you. You know what I mean? They don't look like you. Uh, or the program wasn't really uh, legit in this sense. So there was only so much delegation I can do. Causing all this disruption, I needed a solution. So I spent a year uh, with my team developing this program that has everything covered from A to B, where you have RD on, on, on the staff, you have nutritionists on the staff, where we develop these Mill this meal planning program where you get your macro and your micro information based on your personal preference. We have over 3,000 plant-based recipes in there, and you can remove up to 700 ingredients for either because you have an allergy or you have a preference. If you don't like soy, even if you don't wow. like avocado, gluten, tomatoes, you can remove that, and we'll produce a recipe, a meal plan specifically for you. And what was more important for me, too, because a lot of those programs out there people will go to meal planning programs in the market space now cost anywhere between 200 to $300 per yeah. month. Wow. I wanted to make it accessible and more importantly, affordable. Yeah. Um, because 
my background I come from, um, if we want people to eat plant-based, we had to give them some education in the sense of being free in a lot of different ways. And it's very affordable for less than $2 a week. You get access to all these programs. You get access to these health coaches that's going to get you there Monday through Friday. You can mm-hmm. call into them. You can email them. You can chat them. And we walk you step by step by either you want to get shredded, you want to get big, or you just want to eat to save animals. We help you out from point A to point B. It's a very beautiful program. Wow. Very inexpensive, too. So good that you remove things as well because people are, I'd love to go vegan, but I'm allergic to nuts. Uh, yep, you know? <laughs> got you covered. You're allergic to nuts. I love to go vegan, but I only got five minutes for the kitchen. Yeah. We got you. Boom. You can set it for five minutes in the kitchen, 10 minutes in the kitchen, or you can set it for 50 minutes. You can even set your advanced levels, and you tell us what you have in your kitchen. Well, I have a Vitamix, but I don't have a stove, but <laughs> I don't have a microwave. Tell us exactly what you have. It takes five minutes to fill out that questionnaire, and we'll f- we'll formulate that meal plan for you and your lifestyle. Wow. It's See, really, it's really top of the level. You're right. taking uh, people's excuses away. Oh, yeah, no well, more excuses, less yeah, excuses. Well, the better. Well, yeah, again, again, those that are in those situations mm-hmm. where they can definitely go plant based and and make mm-hmm. that connection. Yeah, excuses are gone. Whether yeah. you're a working professional, a college student on a budget, a soccer mom, or somebody that's just not sure, we got a program for you. That's and we're not non judgmental. We'll send you emails. We'll will help you. We truly do get involved with you day to day. Wow. So a lot of the time before you were just talking about the problem. This is the problem. The animals are being hurt and you got to stop eating. But you weren't giving them this sort of tailored solution to people. Exactly. A lot of us do. A lot yeah. of us that are speaking out about yeah. animals, I'll say, well, go vegan, go vegan. It's like, okay, how do I go vegan? Uh, or they'll direct them to a website they haven't even vetted themselves. Mm-hmm. And then they'll go to that website and they'll be like, eh, and they'll end up falling. People want to be associated with websites based on the way you eat, you mm-hmm. specifically, Joey Carson, mm-hmm. or you, John Doe, or you, Dominic Thompson. Mm-hmm. And I use my own meal plan program, too. You know, So it's based on the way I produce as an athlete. So what do you – so you, you use your own meal pr- program. What are your um, requirements for protein? How do you get that? How do you design your diet? What do you eat predominantly? Yeah, so it really depends on what I'm training for. Mm-hmm. Um, for the, you, the listeners out there um, – May or may not know I'm a multi-sport athlete, so I done did Ironman, triathlons, I done did marathons wow. and more. Um, my background includes powerlifting and more. I, I have a very colorful background in the sense of um, athletic and fitness achievement. So if I'm training, like I took three years off from um, the triathlon circuit, but I'm getting back into it next year. So if I'm training for like an endurance sport, it's a different type of meal plan. It's a different type of program. I'm going more uh raw base with respect to smoothies and yeah. juicing and stuff like that because not only is it convenient but i'm getting more calories in yeah um and the body just my body and i want to be very clear with this because i think a lot of people don't stop to think about this my body responds differently to certain plants yeah. in the plant-based world i mean you got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of plants out there um i think there's over I don't even want to give that number without saying I think it's over 30,000 different types of plants that we can eat edibly now that's on record. I think I could be wrong with that number, but people body responds differently to plants. Like my body might respond amazing to juice watermelons with beets in terms of a pre-workout. Yours may not. You may respond better to just juice beets. Mm. Uh, and your muscles might even uh, take better to like a smoothie filled with mangoes and mm-hmm. bananas, and mine might take better to a smoothie filled with hemp seeds and bananas or mm-hmm. whatever the case may be. I think that's what's beautiful about this lifestyle because you get to tweak it as you go. You get to just enjoy the journey. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, don't just rely on this. Don't follow Dominic's specific his personal meal plan. You get you create your own meal plan through us, uh, but also tweak it as you go because yeah. you may. Find yourself doing amazing things on a, a kale-based smoothie or a vegan bowl, and you're feeling very um, fulfilled versus someone that say, hey, I just want to keep it empty and keep it light yeah. and go with a smoothie. So it, it varies. And biologically speaking, there's protein in everything. Yeah. Uh, and I'm pretty sure everybody on your platform already knows that. Yeah, there protein. might be some that don't, and they yeah. might be uh, <laughs> you know, wondering, how much do you weigh? I weigh about 200 pounds. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Big yeah. boy, so you got to eat a lot of calories. And no, not at all. No, yeah, no, yeah. No. I, and I, I, again, people think I'm bigger than that. They, uh, when you look, uh, uh, look at me in person, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you feel people think I'm like 220, 210, or something like that. But I get all the way down to like when I'm doing triathlons, I get down to like 185, solid, just solid. But I'm still. 
the the muscles are not going anywhere. I mean, they they they'll get more shredded in yeah. a sense, you know what I mean? But for the most part, it's still there because uh, I'm naturally uh, a big guy in that sense. Uh, but protein wise, uh, I get anywhere between 50 to 100 grams of protein per day. Wow. Um, and it's and that and that's that, not that, me- that that's not that much. That's not that. That's much. not that much at all. Yeah, fifty to one hundred grams of protein. Protein is overrated. Yeah. Um, what people fail to realize is, with respect to protein, it's only so much the body can process in one sitting. Yeah. The rest of it's going out your ass. Yeah. It's just waste. Your body depends on your body type, your size. Can only process sometimes up to fifteen grams or ten. You, you it varies. It varies on you. Even genetics varies. But for the most part. Your body's not going to process a hundred grams of protein in one sitting. You're going to be sh- you're going to be shitting and passing gas mm-hmm. like it's no tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, it needs time to re- recover from that that protein specifically. Wow, and it's a big focus for bodybuilders eating like a whole chicken a day just to get their protein. Well, that's because of the marketers. It's yeah. an unregulated industry. The supplement industry mm-hmm. wants you to buy tubs and tubs of protein and other supplements. Uh, it's unregulated by governments in the u.s and the governments over here no one regulates the supplement industry yeah. so they can say all they want about yeah you need a gram per pound or point 1.5 per pound and stuff like that and it's just you have to be very critical about where you're getting that information mm-hmm. from um there's no real science to back that up um like i said i get 50 100 grams of protein and i'm still able to outlift some of the biggest boys out there there's guys yeah. that weigh more than me that can't even bang with me on a weight nah. pile and stuff like that and you also have to be critical too to realize some people are taking shortcuts yeah. you know what i mean like so don't get caught up in the hype of bodybuilding and, and aesthetics thinking like oh i can look like that if i eat plant-based or i can achieve that goal because some of those guys and girls are taking peds and stuff like that so you got to be very conscious about that too as well would you say carbohydrates are more important for athletic performance absolutely you need the energy carbohydrate good whole plant-based carbohydrates not the not the box processed foods no um those are i mean ironically everything you consume even the most reprocessed foods have some form of protein in it but you don't want that type of protein because it has a lot of other additives in it even harmful metals in some scenarios with the powder form so you got to be careful with that Mm -hmm. um where you're sourcing your protein from specifically very interesting and i'm very surprised that you're only getting between 50 to 100 grams of protein a lot of people are yeah Yeah. very very surprised at that i thought you were going to say something like 200 grams nope nope (laughs) not at all 50 to 100 is all i need so um where to from here? What, what's your aspirations from here on out? Uh, yeah, so right now we're um, we're moving into phase two of Eat What Elephants Eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, phase one has been a success. We have a great community of subscribers and people that are now uh, either, if you want to call them plant-based or vegan or reducitarian, whatever you want to define them as. We have a very colorful demographic in that mm-hmm. sense. And we're moving into phase two, which is introducing our superfood lines for smoothies, whether you're talking about raw cacao, hemp seeds. Um, and some athletes do want a quick way to get a smoothie in them through the f- sense of uh, something ethically sourced in, a, in the form of powder protein. So we're developing like a new type of product in that sense. So superfood line is coming out. Phase three uh, is our juice and smoothie bars that will be out. And, and then phase four is the restaurants I told you about wow. uh, where people can um, eat plant-based based on uh, a lot of the recipes we provide on the meal plan program. It's a really dope um, ecosystem that I'm developing in that sense. Eat what elephants eat is going to be uh, something amazing. So will they be able to meet the same requirements? So will they be like, okay, I will go to your restaurant. Uh- <laughs> no, the re- no, the restaurants is about experience. Yeah, you, yeah. Don't have, you get a chance to, uh, honestly, if we was in my place right now, I'll show you some of our most um, desired bowls. And you guys can look on my gram yeah. or eat well if it's eat to see those bowls. But people that had an opportunity to make the vegan bowl or even experience me making the vegan bowl, um, uh, it's pretty much an amazing uh, recipe. I'm really happy about those bowls that we're gonna put out there nice. in the sense of a restaurant experience. So yeah, yeah, Sounds. that's just where we're that's where we're going right now. Just trying to I'm just trying to really at the end of the day feed the world because also another part of the phase of eat well offensive we're gonna be acquiring a lot of uh, urban lands for uh, urban farming. Um, wow. uh, in that sense, where we're gonna have uh, small lands to um, employ uh, local native and people in that in our community uh, that need a second chance a third chance and teach them a whole different skill set and also to serve an underserved community people living in food deserts and stuff 
that's what we're going to be doing. And our number one customer, our customers are going to be our community and also our storefront and our juice and smoothie bar. So truly farm to table is a philosophy in the next three to five years that we're going to do with Eat Well If It's Eat. Amazing. Seems like you've got it all mapped out. And that's such a good idea to bring into the communities and educate them and have it their own little food farm there. It's really good. Yeah, educate and feed. And most, most importantly, too, like I said, uh, give people second chances and even people that deserve third chances that need employment and just truly educate them about um, the beautiful thing about plants and stuff like that. Um, I don't see enough of that going on, and I, we we want to really uh, be a trailblazer in that sense to create this amazing uh, eco farm system and, and urban gardening and more to really have people um, be inspired and learn um, uh, whole new skill sets that they can thrive off of, and even hopefully have a career on. As we grow, they will grow specifically, uh, and then we'll have a main farm too, um, as well. That'll be off away from there where we have more crop and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also have an area for rescued animals as well. So, yeah. so Cause, good. Cause my passion is always animals, but yeah. also my passion is human animals too. So I'm mm. just trying to. This helps both. Yeah, it helps both too. Really yeah. good. Yeah. Any last words, any last inspiring words for those listening? There might be vegans listening, might be some non-vegans listening, activists listening. What would you say to everyone? I think everybody needs to, uh, or I would like for everyone to understand that life is complex. You mm. know, it's a, it's a challenge and not everyone um, really understands that what other people may be going through is having an impact on the way they produce and, 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 and the things they do in society. Saying all that to say is that just be assertive in your activism. To the activists out there, be assertive in your activist, activism. Um, and don't feel ashamed that you may not be doing a street activism or or doing another form of activism don't feel like you're being not included Mm -hmm. um, because there's many forms of activism you have Mm -hmm. food activism you have those that are active with showing their bodies Mm -hmm. you have people that are active with showing their intel intellect Mm -hmm. you have people activists through podcasting and you have street activism i think it's a beautiful thing where you have different forms of active activism get involved in one of them that you feel comfortable with um, but go at your pace and be assertive and not aggressive Um, uh, so that's really what i want to really say to people about that Brother, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it a lot and keep up the amazing work. And I hope everyone goes and follows you. And if they need a meal plan, eat whatever elephants eat. Yeah, they need anything. If you just want to connect with me, uh, yeah, yeah, just reach out to me. I'm thank an you. open book. Yep. Thanks so yeah. much, bro. Right. Thanks for having me. Cheers, bro. Yep. <laughs>